I love to ice skate. As I glide along the ice, my heart feels overwhelming joy. My body feels weightless. It feels limitless. And I wonder if this is how heaven feels. Until I try to learn a new trick. My feet turn into bricks. My body goes one way. My legs go another. And my arms flail. And I can barely launch myself into the air until, inevitably, I come crashing back down to the ice. And I realize I am feeble and frail and, well, very, very but you know who isn't finite? God. Who isn't limited by skills? God. Who isn't trapped in a body? God. God is infinite. God has no beginning and no end. He has always existed and he always will. And this is why Jesus, God declared his name to be I am. God is. God is who he is. I am eternally, infinitely present. God has no size, no place can contain God because God is uncontainable. And no one can put a box around God because God is unconfinable and no one can measure God for everything God is is measureless. God's knowledge has no limits. Talking with a friend about her lost job, I said, I wonder what God's reason is for removing you from this job. And she corrected me, you mean God's one billion reasons for this? God's infinite ways means his one sovereign act creates a billion blessings, billion teaching moments, and whatever else he intends to ripple out into the future. God's power has no limits. God's love has no limits. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all perfectly infinite. As we enter into Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 15, we learn the Pharisees laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. Uh, verse 15, then the Pharisees went out, went out and laid, a, laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They said, he sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. So they don't know who they're dealing with, do they? No one can trap an infinite God? How can humans put a boundary confining God? How can you measure or even evaluate the knowledge of an infinite God? They presume they can tease out a limit to Jesus's knowledge, but instead who they find is an infinite, unlimited God. Maybe if they cover their cruel hearts with smooth words, God won't see our trap and we can actually trap him. Teacher, they call him. Clearly, they have no interest in being taught by the only one with unlimited knowledge. Verse 16, teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You teach the way of God. You are unswayed by popular opinion or cultural acceptance. Sadly, everyone gets fooled by disingenuous people. Everyone, but Jesus, that is. And they set their finite minds against an infinite they set their pride in their knowledge of culture against a God with infinite knowledge of the universe, the one who created everything. Jesus sees in one glance, infinitely back to the origin of their thinking and way into the future, the implications of his response. And he knew 2,000 years later, we, you and I, would be reading and imagining this very moment in scripture. One pebble in the water with a billion ripples of teaching moments for his followers in first century and 21st century. Jesus is infinitely intentional. So then they asked Jesus tricky question number one about paying taxes. And any answer Jesus gives will bother either the Roman authorities or the Jewish people. And so instead, Jesus responds by showcasing his infinite, limitless knowledge of their evil intent to trap him also the high value of the teaching moment they laid up for him. Jesus intentionally turns this into a teaching not on taxes, but on whose image we bear. Jesus says to the coin, on the coin, whose image is imprinted on the coin, and it's Caesar. And so he says, give to Caesar whatever is bearing Caesar's image. But you Jewish leaders, you people of faith, you believers in Jesus Christ, you are imprinted by God as God's people. You bear God's image. So dedicate what bears God's image to God. How are you bearing God's image or the world's image? And what belongs to God that you need to rededicate to him? Your 
time, your talent, your treasure, your words, but what about your Sunday worship and your Sabbath rest and your prayer time and what you watch on television, your career choice and your ministry direction? What do you need to rededicate that already belongs to God? In verse 22, the Pharisees who heard this were amazed. They could not trap the limitless God, but instead of letting their amazement inspire worship, they were amazed and they walked away from the God of the universe. So how do you respond? When God does the unexpected in your life, even when he feels like an enigma, too big to grasp, too hard to understand, you have a choice. Will you lean in to Jesus or walk away from him? Tricky question number two in verse 23, having watched the Pharisees epic fail at restraining Jesus, the Sadducees take a shot. The Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And yet, so very hypocritical, they try to test and trap Jesus by asking him a question inconsistent with their belief. They ask, at the resurrection, which, by the way, we don't believe in, whose wife will this woman be who's been married to seven brothers? And I love Jesus' response. I always love Jesus' response. In verse 29, he says, you're in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. They exalt the scripture, but they never read it to understand God. Their knowledge of the word and God's heart for for preserving scripture was very terribly limited. You and I do this too, don't we? We we may not even know scripture, but then when we do know scripture, do we know it as the living words of our limitless God with his limitless implications of why he said what he does? We, We don't know that. We're very limited in our understanding of what God says. No matter how many times we read it, we will discover um, the, the, the layers, the many layers of God. Now, but we compare that to Jesus, the living words, who breathes life with every word he speaks, and he is the author of the scriptures. And Jesus is also infinitely powerful and omnipotent. Jesus explains at the resurrection there's no marriage, just like the angels are unmarried. And then Jesus quotes scriptures that they should have known. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, God declares, I am, I am in present tense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. God is the God of the living. He's a living God. God is, God was, God will always be the I am, eternal and infinite. So what difference does it make For you to know God is the I am, the infinite God of the living, the I am, to Christians who have physically died but are spiritually with God forever. Now, tricky question number three. Having watched the Sadducees fail, the Pharisees want back in the boxing match, and they send in a lawyer who tests Jesus, asking, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And quoting from their own Hebrew Bible, Jesus, the infinite expert, explains, most important Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And next, love your neighbor as yourself. All of God's commandments flow from these two greatest commandments. Jesus gave an infinitely incontestable answer. So how are you growing in wholehearted love for the Lord as we study his word? And how are you loving him well with your soul, your mind, your mouth, your calendar? Now Jesus has questions for them. And he has questions explain his infinite nature as God. He, they ask, what, what do you know about the Messiah? What do you think about the Messiah? And they respond, he is the son of David. And they know this from the Old Testament, but they also know Jesus was a descendant of, of David. So let's read verse 43 and 44. Then Jesus said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. This is a vision the Holy Spirit gave to David. God the Lord said to David's Lord Jesus, sit at my right hand. So even David understood Jesus is David's Lord. Jesus is the human son of David and Jesus is the divine son of God. No one else has both of these titles All arrows point to Jesus as the Messiah sent to save us from our sins. So Jesus is the Savior Messiah who now infinitely rules in heaven, limitless in his ability to save, limitless in his eternal reign. 
infinitely worthy of our honor and our praise. God knows everyone's true motives. While we are limited, we must not be hostile to the unlimited nature of God. Tricks and traps don't honor the Messiah, but honest questions do. And your desire to understand more of who our God is, who is measureless and uncontainable, that honors God. So what questions do you have of God? Ask him. Ask him. So write your questions for God. And, and let me ask you some other harder questions. Why do you have these questions? What is your goal of finding answers to these questions? And what will you do with the answer if it's different than what you expect? Conversations with the infinite God will always generate a response in you. In chapter 22, we saw responses, amazement, abandonment, astonishment, silence, and fear. And what is your response to God in your quiet time? All right, moving to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew uses his gospel to prove Jesus is the promised eternal infinite king of the universe. And in light of Jesus as king, how are we, you and me, supposed to live? as his kingdom people, his disciples. Well, we were first introduced to this in Matthew chapter five, the eight Beatitudes. This is how kingdom-minded people live. With infinite wisdom as the infinite teacher of truth, Jesus now invites two sets of people into the boxing ring, humble kingdom-minded disciples who exalt Jesus and hypocrites who exalt themselves. Kingdom-minded disciples and hypocrites. And Jesus says in verses two through four, these teachers of the law, these Jewish Pharisees, they know the scriptures and they will tell you what to do, but they don't do it themselves. And Jesus hates this. And he sums that up in 11 and 12. The greatest among you will be your servant for whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Wholehearted followers are inwardly and outwardly consistent. So now let's see Jesus' infinite wisdom as he teaches Christ-exalting discipleship versus self-exalting thinking. And to do this, Jesus perfectly pairs the eight Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount to the eight woes he tells in chapter 23. Let's just go through these slides, or I'll go through these side-by-side -side, uh, comparisons. So the first comparison in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Christ-exalting discipleship says the kingdom of heaven is open to the poor and the humble. And on the equivalent of that, chapter 23, verse 13, the kingdom of heaven is shut by and to prideful, exclusive hypocrites. Number two, the, in chapter 5, verse 4, those who mourn will be comforted. Verses 23, 14, hypocrites bring grief and they are punished. In the third comparison, Matthew chapter 5, 5 says the meek will inherit the earth. In verses 23, 15, religious people traverse the land to gain converts destined for hell. In the Beatitudes chapter 5, verse 6, they, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. And in verses 23, 16 to 22, they will twist, hypocrites will twist the truth for personal gain and self-appointed and number the fifth, uh, chapter five, verse seven, the merciful are given mercy. Verses 23, 23 and 24, the hypocrites major on the minors, overlooking mercy and faithfulness. In number six, num chapter five, verse eight, the pure in heart will see God. And verses chapter 25, 23, verses 25 and 26, hypocrites neglect inward humor, inward purity, leaving them spiritually blind. Comparison number seven, beatitude number seven, chapter five, verse nine, the peacemakers will, are called the sons of God uh, compared to the self-exalting woes. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 to 28, hypocrites cause, their actions cause strife, confusion, and death. And then uh, Beatitude number eight, chapter five, verses 10 through 12, the persecute, they're persecuted for righteousness, those who will inherit the kingdom of God. And compared that with the self-exalting woes, verses 23, 29 through 33, the hypocrites are persecutors of God's righteous people. Self-exalting discipleship and Christ-exalting discipleship, 
self-exalting hypocrites. Woes to them. Woe to them. Jesus has infinite knowledge of our every thought. Jesus has infinite understanding to know how all that we say and think will affect the kingdom of God. One pebble, one billion intentional ripples of teaching moments of grace. And while God is infinite and he has revealed his truth to us, and we are responsible to truly believe it and live it out. In verses 34 to 37, Jesus knows who will be murdered by them in just a few days. And even with that in mind, Jesus turns his gaze once again to overlook the lostness of Jerusalem. And his vision and his verbiage take us right back to the beginning of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 1. With infinite wisdom, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. It was not only a geographic move, but it was a deeply theological one. Disciples and enemies of Jesus cannot be on the same team. Disciples will flourish as they trust and obey God's infinite nature, and enemies of Jesus will flounder as they maneuver to outwit Jesus' infinite nature. Jesus is infinite. He cannot be destroyed. He cannot be tied up. He cannot be contained or trapped or tripped. He cannot gain or lose insight to your life. His knowledge and wisdom of every action and subsequent reaction is infinite. So what difference would it make in your life if you genuinely trusted the limitlessness of Jesus? Here's what I pray you believe. God's infinite nature is worthy of infinite worship. God's infinite nature is worthy of infinite worship in which he is created. Beautiful God, thank you for being infinite. Thank you that we can never be tired of worshiping you because your attributes are truly infinite. Thank you for understanding that we will never understand you and we will have questions. But we thank you that you have put the Holy Spirit in us to not only help us understand our questions, but to understand and even rethink why we're asking them. May we honor you in all we say and do. Worthy of your infinite nature, we give you infinite worship. In your name, Lord Jesus, 